so walking it through the first chunk of this, chapters 13 and 14, look at it with me, providing an introduction to the whole of the second half um, of the book, and seeing right off the top the power of the gospel to confront evil and to impress a pagan governor. Chapter 13, verses 4 to 12. The first thing that happens, they get to Cyprus, and they're going through the land. They're speaking in the synagogues, but the thing that Luke highlights is the meeting with this false prophet called Bar-Jesus, or Elimas, who Paul then rebukes, and he, uh, he is blinded. Interesting echo of Paul's own blindness, of course. And uh, the proconsul, the Roman governor, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man, says Luke, as somebody was saying over, uh, um, over supper, we want to add, uh, bless his heart. An intelligent man, bless his heart. Um, when the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. And we see like a little cloud, no bigger than a man's hand, coming up out of the sea, something that Luke is wanting to say. You Romans out there reading this, you Romans who may be interested to know who this Paul fellow is, uh, actually, here was one of your own, and he was pretty smart, and he saw Paul right at the beginning of Paul's mission, and he, to his own surprise, came to faith. It's rather like the centurion at the foot of the cross, isn't it? The first person who looks at the dying Jesus and says, truly, this man was the son of God. It's a Roman centurion. And so here, a Roman governor coming to faith. And that just serves as a little opening cameo. Luke is awfully good at this, like the beginning of his gospel, where you get those, the cameo sketch of uh, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth, which prepares you rather like the opening uh, scenes in a Shakespeare play. It isn't the main action, but it prepares you, gets the mind ready for the main action. And then we get into the main action in chapter 13 with the big set piece, which is the speech in the synagogue in Pisidian Antioch, chapter 13, verses 13 to 52. And again, we have a brief history of Israel, a different way of telling the story this time to the one we had in chapter 7 with Stephen, because this one, we get very quickly into the giving of a king, verses 21 and 22, Saul, son of Kish, followed by David, and then Almost at once, uh, Paul moves to talk about Jesus. And of course, there's a lot more about Jesus here because we're out in the wider world where they probably just haven't even heard about this man, Jesus, at all yet. So whereas Stephen didn't need to say much about Jesus because everyone in Jerusalem basically knew the story, here Paul has to tell the story in much more detail. But again, it is a Davidic story from this man's seed, from his posterity. God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he'd promised. And interestingly, we talk about John the Baptist as well as the one who pointed forward to Jesus, and now that's happened. And so then the challenge, the challenge that Jesus died, he was given up by his own people, handed over to the pagans, God raised him from the dead, and now we bring you the good news. Verses 32 and 33, what God has promised to our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children. This is the fundamental message. And we were talking about supersessionism and all that earlier on. You cannot tell the Christian story Christianly without saying this is the fulfillment of those ancient promises. If you take that away, you collapse into Marcionism, into a dualism, which says that Judaism was a bad sort of religion and we've got rid of that and we've got something different. No. All that went before was good, but it was a set of signposts pointing forwards, pointing forwards to this point. And so then we get a flurry of Scripture. And again, the use of Scripture here is fascinating. We go now to the second psalm, which we had a, a different bit of earlier on. But now in verse 33, you are my son, today have I begotten you. And then uh, again, uh, interestingly now from Isaiah 55, I will give you the holy promises made to David. You remember how it works in Isaiah 55? The democratization of the Davidic promise that uh, anyone who thirsts, come to the waters and drink, and I will make with you, all of you, anyone from anywhere, the promises I made to David, they're going to stretch right out to everybody. And the way that has happened, says Paul, is through Jesus, the Davidic Messiah, because the effect of his work is now to include anybody and everybody. 
And then we go to Psalm 16, which we had already in Acts 2. You will not let your Holy One see corruption. And then, interestingly, a few verses later, as part of the warning from Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5, in verse 41, Look, you scoffers, be amazed and perish, for in your days I'm doing a work to you. You'll never believe even if someone tells you. What is Habakkuk talking about? Habakkuk is warning the people of God that God is raising up the Gentiles and that the Gentiles, if they're not careful, will come in and attack them. What Paul is doing is taking that text and turning it round in a slightly different way, but it's still a warning to Israel that unless they get their act together and listen to the word that God is speaking, then God is raising up the Gentiles in a different sense, not to attack Israel, but actually to share in the promises which were made to Israel. And the result, of course, is, well, in the NRSV here, which I've got, in verse 45, it's jealousy. But the word for jealousy is, of course, the Greek word zelon, zeal, Z-E-L, Z-E-A-L, zeal. And zeal is not just jealousy, oh, you've got a nice smart watch and I haven't and I'm jealous of you. Zeal is a major category for Saul of Tarsus, a major category for first century Judaism. Zeal is what you have when your heart is so burning on fire, that's what the word means, with a love for God, for Israel's God, for his temple, for the land, for his law, for his word, for his truth. That if anyone is breaking that stuff, if anyone is belittling it, you're prepared to do whatever it takes, either to bring them into line or if they won't come into line, to eliminate them. Zeal is something you do with a sword or a dagger or with beatings in the synagogue and so on. And now Saul of Tarsus was a man who knew all about zeal. That's where he had been. If, if you weren't zealous, you wouldn't have got authority from the chief priest to go charging off to Damascus to take those wretched Christians captive. It was because they were letting the side down. And you see, letting the side down has eschatological implications. If you're waiting for the kingdom of God, if you're longing for God's new age to break in, if you believe that now is the time for the prophecies to be fulfilled, then if there are Jews letting the side down, if there are Jews fraternizing with Gentiles, if there are people who are giving up on the food laws or not circumcising their male children or whatever, then you have to act. Because if Israel is in a mess like that, you will delay, perhaps fatally, the coming of the kingdom. There's an eschatological agenda at stake. And it goes back, in the, the zeal tradition goes back to Elijah killing the prophets of Baal. It goes back to Phinehas, who killed the Midianite woman and the Israelite who was sleeping with her. Uh, and these figures become legendary in Jewish folklore and imagination. The great people of zeal. And in Galatians chapter 1, Paul talks about being exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. That's what he was up to, role modeling Elijah particularly. Well, and I, I've written about that in various places in, in when he's talking in Galatians chapter one. 